Okay, so before we talk about all these crazy data structures like maps and heaps, we want a quantifiable way to measure how efficient the certain data structures are at different tasks we might ask of it. If we're going to be storing extremely large amounts of data, being able to search through, modify, or access the information within a data structure needs to be fast and efficient. As we mentioned before, the industry standard for this kind of stuff is big O notation. So what exactly is big O notation, and how do we measure it for a specific data structure? Well, that's what we'll be covering in today's segment. For every data structure in this series, we're going to be spending some time talking about its efficiency using big O notation. So this is definitely a topic you're not going to want to skip. All right, let's begin. So because there are many different ways to store information, like we talked about in the previous segment, programmers have developed this idea of big O notation as a way to basically score a data structure based on four different criteria. These four criteria are the most common functions you might want from a data structure. The ability to access a specific element within the data structure, search for an element within the data structure, insert an element into the data structure, and delete an element from the data structure. Now by measuring how efficiently a certain data structure can do these four things, we can basically create a report card of sorts which measures how effective a certain data structure is. If we need to store data that is easily accessible to the end user, for example, we might choose a data structure which can access elements within itself the fastest. Vice versa, if accessing elements isn't the most important thing to us, but we need a data structure which can easily be added to and deleted from, we would go for one which is fastest in that specific functionality. By looking at data structures report card, if you will, we can get a better understanding of what they're good at and what they're bad at. Okay, so if big O notation basically creates a report card, like I said, there must be some way to actually grade each of these functions, and there is. The four criteria mentioned, accessing, searching, inserting, and deleting these elements all use big O notation time complexity equations to be graded, if you will. Now what is a big O notation time complexity equation? Well, I'm glad you asked. A time complexity equation works by inserting the size of the data set as an integer n and returning the number of operations that need to be completed by the computer before the function can finish. The integer n is simply the size or amount of elements contained within the data set. So for example, if we have an array of size 10, we would place 10 into the different equations for accessing, searching, inserting, and deleting used for an array, and return back to us would be the number of operations that need to be conducted by the computer before completion of that function. Now the reason it's called big O notation is because the syntax for these particular equations includes a big O and then a set of parentheses. Inside the parentheses will include some function which will correctly return the number of operations needed to be run by the computer. So for example, let's say we have a fake function. It can really be anything. The purpose in this case is irrelevant. Now for this fake function, let's say its time complexity equation was the one shown on your screen now. We pronounce the time complexity equation as O of 2, meaning it takes two operations from the computer before our make-believe function can finish. If the time complexity equation was O with a 5 in the parentheses, instead it would be O of 5, and so on. Now these are examples of time complexity equations which run in constant time, meaning no matter the size of our data set, it will always take the same number of instructions to run but that's usually not going to be the case when it comes to the four criteria we want to measure for our data structures. Most of the time, our integer n, which again contains the amount of elements within the data set, is going to have some effect on how many operations it takes to, say, search through our data structure, which makes sense. A larger data set means it's going to take more instructions to search through that entire data set. Now we measure the efficiency of these four functionalities in the number of operations performed because measuring by how long the function takes to run would be silly. Measuring by time is highly biased by the hardware used to run the function. A supercomputer used by Google is obviously going to be able to search through a data structure much faster than a laptop, and so big O notation time complexity equations returns the number of operations instead to eliminate the bias in processing power that exists. So to sum up everything so far, we measure the efficiency, or speed, of a data structure based on how well it can perform four simple tasks, accessing, searching for, inserting, and deleting elements within itself. Each of these criteria is modeled by an equation, which takes in the size of the data structure in number of elements, n, and returns the amount of operations needed to be performed by the computer before it is completed. 
By measuring these four things, we can get a pretty good understanding of what the data structure is good at and what the data structure is bad at. Now it's important to note that this isn't the end-all be-all for deciding on which data structure to use in your program. As you'll see as this series progresses, many of the data structures were invented with specific quirks or features which separate them from the rest. Big O notation is incredibly useful and something you should definitely take into consideration when determining which data structure to implement into your program, but it should not be the only thing you use to decide on a data structure. Okay, cool. Now that we know a little bit about how we measure the efficiency of a data structure using time efficiency equations, along with the four criteria used to actually measure data structures, let's dive into what the actual equations that each criteria can be mean. That way, when we start talking about them for each data structure, you'll roughly know how good or bad each one is at that particular task. Basically, we're going to be covering the five most common time complexity efficiency equations, starting from fastest and going to the slowest. Now the absolute best a data structure can score on each criteria is a time complexity equation of O of 1. This essentially means that no matter what the size of your data set is, the operation will be completed in a single step. If your data has one element, it'll finish in one step. If your data has 100 elements, one step. 1 million elements, doesn't matter. The computer will finish the function in one step. This is why when we look at a graph of volume of data versus instructions required, the line remains constant at one. No matter the volume of data being used, the computer can complete that task in a single instruction. Whether it be accessing, searching, inserting, or deleting an element from the data structure. O of 1 is the gold standard, absolute best, top of its class efficiency equation. It is basically the Michael Jordan when it comes to time complexity equations. The next fastest type of time complexity equation is O log n. While not as fast as instantaneous time, a function having O log n will still provide you with a very fast completion for operations. While you may not fully understand logarithms entirely, just know that this efficiency is slower than instantaneous time, O of 1 and faster than the next level of efficiency, known as O of n. Additionally, because a volume versus instructions needed graph follows a logarithmic curve, the larger data set you use, the more bang for your buck you're going to get. Basically, as the amount of data you try to perform one of our four criteria on increases, the rate of change of the amount of operations it takes to complete that certain task decreases. So as you can see, at the beginning of the graph here, when we increase the volume of data, our number of operations skyrockets. But when we do the same for larger and larger data sets, our number of operations increases much more slowly than before. A good example of a non-data structures related function which has a time complexity of O log n is the binary search. If you know what a binary search is, you'll understand how when our data set gets larger, the number of instructions needed to find the item you're looking for doesn't increase at the same rate. Now if you don't know what a binary search is, but you would like to know in order to better understand O log n, both a card in the top right and a link into the description will take you to the point in our introduction to programming series where you will learn about it. If not, let's move on to the next equation. O of n is the next common time complexity efficiency equation type that's going to come up during this series. The graph of volume of data versus number of instructions for this function is linear meaning for every element you add to the data set, the amount of instructions needed to complete the function will increase by the same amount. So to perform a function with a time complexity of O of n on a data set with 10 elements, it will take 10 instructions. 50 elements will take 50 instructions, 1,000 elements, 1,000 instructions, and so on. O of n is really the last good efficiency equation that exists. Anything above this is considered inefficient and not very practical when it comes to data structures. Speaking of inefficiency, the next type of equation that will come up is O n log n. This equation is the first that's relatively bad in terms of efficiency. The graph of volume versus operations needed shows a somewhat linear but increasing graph, meaning unlike O log n, it won't be better in terms of efficiency as time goes on. The last two types of equations are O of n squared and O of 2 to the n. These are both incredibly inefficient equations which should be avoided if at all possible. Because they are both exponential in structure, which can be seen from their graphs of volume versus operations needed, the larger the dataset you use, the more inefficient it will become. 
While there are more equations that exist, such as O of n factorial, which is even worse than the two I just mentioned, the data structures we'll be talking about will never have time complexity equations that exist outside of the five we just covered, so we're going to stop there. Now the final thing I want to talk about is just a reiteration of something I said before. These time complexity equations are not the only metric you should be using to gauge which data structure to use. As we get deeper and deeper into this series, you'll see we talk about many data structures which don't seem that efficient based on their time complexity equations, but provide some other functionality that make them extremely useful for programmers. All right, now that we have some basic knowledge on how we actually grade these data structures in terms of efficiency, let's hop into our first data structure, the array.